Well, at least these movies kept the Razzies in business. Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Watch Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 worst movies of the decade. It is I, Merlin. The wizard? <laughs> Remember me? That means we're taking a look at movies released between 2010 and 2019 that reached the bottom of the barrel, and in a few cases, below the bottom of the barrel. Anyway, regardless, a spoiler alert is now in effect. All right, let's check out the suckage. Number 10, Holmes and Watson. Oh my god! Oh, shit! Watson, stop panicking! We can disable the queen! After Talladega Nights and Step Brothers, we were all ready for another Will Ferrell and John C. Riley collaboration to be a laugh riot. The only mystery in Holmes and Watson is how so many funny people produced such a clueless, not to mention elementary comedy. The movie basically follows the same formula as every other Will Ferrell star vehicle. An egotistical buffoon needs to learn the value of humility and friendship. Ah, uh, the most obvious conclusion. This time, however, the formula is devoid of anything resembling charm, humor, or effort. In 2018, did the filmmaker seriously think that people would laugh at jokes about fake mustaches, the Titanic, and women being doctors? What does doctor mean in America? It means doctor. The fact that Sony couldn't even pawn this inevitable bomb off on Netflix says everything. <gasps> What's look? It's Billy Zay! Sherlock? <laughs> Wow, he's breathtaking. Number nine, Gotti. This life ends one of two ways, dead or in jail. I did both. Congratulations, John Travolta. You've made your silliest movie since Battlefield Earth. Are you not aware that I graduated top of my class? The script for this crime biopic reads like it was written by an AI bot that gathered all of its data from Italian-American stereotypes and gangster cliches. You gotta center this mess, please. Get the f out of here, Ange. Go on. Gotti hits all the familiar mob movie beats, but it's completely deprived of any humanity. When all's said and done, what do we really learn about John Gotti by watching this movie? Well, he was a mob boss, he had a family, he swore a lot, that's about it. There's no real insight into what made Gotti such a fascinating figure. The only thing more confused than the movie itself is the soundtrack which includes the musical stylings of Pitbull and the theme from Shaft. 35 years in the same house as his wife. I mean, that ain't right. That ain't right. Number eight, Bucky Larson, born to be a star. Oh, 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 you hit me in the eye. Oh. We guess you could say that Nick Swartzen was this decade's Rob Schneider, i.e. the guy who frequently pops up in Adam Sandler movies. Whereas Schneider had a few star vehicles back in the day though, Swartzen was given one shot to prove he could carry a movie. I bet acting is fun. If Bucky Larson proves anything, it's that Swartzen was not born to be a star. Centering on a buck-toothed mouth breather who learns his parents were adult film stars, Bucky Larson sets out in pursuit of fame. It's basically a poorer version of Orgasmo, which didn't exactly set the bar very high. Throw in Polly Shore, and you've got a movie that clearly is not even trying. Hey, ma'am, I got your paper. You can leave the paper on the counter. Number seven, The Emoji Movie. Today is my first day on the phone. Oh boy, I'm gonna be so meh. What are you gonna do? In 1914, Windsor McKay premiered his animated short, Gertie the Dinosaur, launching a groundbreaking art form into the mainstream. 103 years later, this art form was used to turn Sir Patrick Stewart into a talking piece of poop. That's because I believe in you. Should we wash our hands? <laughs> <laughs> McKay would be so proud. The Emoji Movie doesn't even feel like a real animated feature, but rather a satire of one. Come to think of it, if smarter writers were involved, maybe this could have been a clever satire about product placement and Hollywood's creative bankruptcy. This feels very odd, and it smells. Since this is a movie about a society that inhabits a device, however, it's nothing more than a commercial, really. As Rotten Tomatoes will tell you, the whole movie can be summed up with a general prohibition sign emoji. <laughs> she said wiped. <laughs> Aim higher, Steven. Number six, Left Behind. They're all gone. 
The religious book series that started it all may be polarizing, but everyone can agree that this film adaptation is an unholy piece of cinema. Bringing a whole new meaning to the disaster genre, Left Behind isn't merely an awful movie. It is a boring movie, which is perhaps the greatest sin of all. Mayday, Mayday. This is Pancon Heavy 257. Acknowledge. When a film revolves around the rapture and stars Nicolas Cage, it should at least be entertainingly bad. Those who went in expecting the next Wicker Man were sorely disappointed to find just how bland, uneventful, and dull Left Behind is. So it couldn't even please audiences who ironically enjoy bad movies. Uh, we never thought we'd say this, but bring back Kirk Cameron. I need a bright visual point of reference so I can see where the landing zone is. Okay, I'm flashing my brights. Can you see that? No, we're too far out for that. I need something bigger and brighter, like a flare. Number five, Loquisha. Go! You live with Loquisha. Welcome to the first episode. Loquisha is the tale of a white man who cannot get a job in radio. So he impersonates a sassy black woman to get on the airwaves. Right, because we all know how hard it is for white males in the workforce and how women of color have everything handed to them. I think you want me to sign off on this victim act and find it charming and tell you you've been wrong. And then you want me to indict half a species based on the actions of a couple of unevolved members of said species. Honestly, how did a movie like this get made in the modern world? It'd be one thing if this was intended to be in poor taste, but the film actually tries to seriously tackle themes like cultural identity, gender inequality, and suicide. Adding insult to injury, our protagonist is portrayed as a, quote, wise, gentle, and kind individual who has all the answers. Writer slash producer slash director slash star Jeremy Savile has made the modern equivalent of 1986's Soul Man. Congratulations, Mr. Watson, and good luck at Harvard. Thank you, sir. I'll do my best. Number four, movie 43. Hello, Mrs. Miller. I'm the pretty girl. She is. Helmed by Peter Farrelly, who'd ironically go on to direct a Best Picture winner only five years later, Movie 43 was supposed to be Kentucky Fried Movie meets Funny or Die. Instead, we got the Citizen Kane of awful, as Richard Roper put it. Comprised of several sketches, this anthology comedy enlisted a cornucopia of gifted actors and filmmakers. The selling point was a skit where Kate Winslet goes on a date with Hugh Jackman, who's given a unique neck abnormality. This is... A nice place. From there, more and more stars signed up for a comedy that ultimately produced few laughs, but plenty of groans and cringes. We dare you to find a movie released this decade that flushed more talent down the toilet. A certain percentage of our younger demographic are sticking there, you know what, in the vent. Mm, no, I don't know what. Number three, the Fifty Shades of Grey franchise. Christian Grey. I'm Anastasia Steele. Given how over-the-top E.L. James's books are, the Fifty Shades of Grey trilogy could have been so bad it's good, not unlike Showgirls. By removing Anastasia Steele's ridiculous narration, though, we're left with a vanilla romance that doesn't even deliver the eroticism the trailers promised. When you really think about it, there isn't that much BDSM in these movies. You bought the company I work for. This isn't a relationship, Christian, it's ownership. Most of the runtime is instead dedicated to beautiful people driving fancy cars, sailing yachts, flying in private planes, and essentially indulging in the 1% lifestyle. Then, when we do get to the sensual stuff, it's kept relatively tame. It all builds to arguably the dumbest ending of the decade in which Anna and Christian live happily ever after. Fitting? Number two, Jack and Jill. How are we doing? Where were you? <laughs> I've been waiting forever for you. This place is creeping me out. We're glad Adam Sandler's closing out the decade with an Oscar-worthy performance in Uncut Gems because he kicked off the decade with a Razzie-winning performance in Jack and Jill. Actually, he gave two Razzie-winning performances, playing Adman Jack and his unbelievably obnoxious twin sister Jill. Oh, polly wally zoom golly golly. That means I want to choke on my own vomit. The film even managed to win a Razzie in every category an unprecedented, um, achievement. Even in a decade that brought us Pixels and Grown Ups 2, Jack and Jill is Sandler's crowning achievement of lazy anti-humor. Al Pacino says it best in the final scene where he orders Jack to burn this. In the story's context, he's talking about a commercial, but it just as easily could be applied to the movie we just endured. What's my name? Dunkachino! Dunkachino! 
I'll give you guys a few clues to see if you can guess what's at number one. It is an adaptation of a beloved property. It was accused of whitewashing, and they even pronounced some of the characters' names wrong. All right, let's check out some dishonorable mentions, and then we'll see if you guessed correctly what's at the top. Why would we need a name? Because we're a team now, and there's four of us, so we should come up with a name for it. But I am warning you, all of you, we will play by my rules now. Man, you just keep surprising me, Grandpa. New dad at 72. Okay, and who's completely gotten rid of Jesus? Satan. Santa. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Where's ho, 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 ho in the Bible? I've seen the bodies. You'll never be able to control them. Control has never been the problem. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, The Last Airbender. Is it okay if you tell me your name? The monks named me Ong. The Last Airbender lived up to its title, but not in the way director M. Night Shyamalan intended. Shyamalan built up this film as if it was gonna kick off Hollywood's next epic trilogy. Between its rushed plot, wooden acting, overproduced special effects, unnatural dialogue, and accusations of whitewashing, though, a sequel naturally never saw the light of day. The good news is that there's already an epic trilogy, the three-season-long animated series that inspired this cinematic travesty. That being said, the fact that The Last Airbender was derived from such a brilliant show is what truly gets under people's skin. A terrible movie is one thing. A terrible movie based on promising source material is just shameful. You're angry. You must let this go. Did, um, did we not see The Dark Tower this decade? Because that movie was bad. Uh, anyway, this is still a solid list, lack of dark McConaughey notwithstanding. Uh, but what do you think? What was the worst movie of the decade? Let us know in the comments or come talk to me on Twitter or Instagram at Rebecca Brayton. Be sure to like and subscribe and please watch this other video.